just talks to me. So, what did she say? She said, are you home? I said, no, I'm, I don't know where we're at. I'm about to start. Sorry. Are you about ready? Yeah, I'm ready when you're We're, we're close. I anticipated about 6.45 with the time. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Ah, thank you, thank you. All right, everyone, please give me your attention. Please give me your attention. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, the lights are so bright up here that uh, if you are doing something which you're not supposed to be doing, which you would never be doing, I probably wouldn't see you anyway. But um, hey, uh, once again, thanks for getting in here in, in, in good order. Uh, what I'm going to do, I just want to get everyone settled, just a couple of, of, of quick, quick announcements today. Everyone should have received an email telling them where they're supposed to go tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning for our um, uh, facilitation, for, for our seminars. And also, I need to meet with all the cadet facilitators for about five minutes after we finish this presentation. And with that, I'm going to ask everybody, as you've done in the past, I'm going to ask everyone to tonight to, to set up and be very respectful, be mindful, those things we talk about with listening, and, uh, and, and uh, please focus in on our, on, on our lecture. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mrs. Gray to introduce our, say hello and, turn, and uh, introduce our guest speaker. Hello, good evening. So good to be here this evening. Again, I really love seeing your faces. There's a lot of you that I don't get to see uh, very regularly, but I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you for your time. Again, we know it's incredibly valuable to you. So thank you for being here. Um, in all organizations, some people work only for a paycheck. I think you know, you, can, you notice that. You notice that in the people that work around you, and that could be adult staff, but it could also be cadets. You, you see some, some of your peers that only work for, for, the, higher, for the higher rank, for grades, and, and they kind of forget that, that the whole purpose of this leadership and character development is really to be authentic, to have this authentic life, and come into a place where you can awaken your servant's heart. This program was not started with paychecks. This program was developed by people who volunteered their time because they cared about you. People like Michelle Bates. Is Michelle here? Michelle has given up so much time of her holiday with her family to be, to be part of the development team behind this project. Um, again, our purpose for this project is to help develop self-awareness so that you can live, so that you can just be more authentic in your life. And it doesn't start five years from now when you leave New Mexico Military Institute. It's every day, every day in the core, every experience, every communication that you have with those around you. We, like I've said this before, we didn't make the road, we're just further along it. And so we are here, here to help guide and do what we can to support you. Again, your happiness matters and some of the things that, that we are teaching, we hope that will lead you to better decision making and, and just, just a happier life. Tonight I ask you to recognize the authentic people around you who live that life. 
for the betterment of themselves and for, the, for you, for the people around them. They hold a high standard, and it's authentic. They're not leading the core and getting drunk and high on the weekends. They're doing it authentically. Consider that. Consider that for yourself and consider that for your peers. Live an authentic life. Some of you are graduating. Some of you only have a couple of months left here. Step into it. You have the opportunity to be some part of something really, really amazing. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Kurt Bruder. He Dr. Bruder is a servant leader. He has a servant's heart. He's a distinguished member of our New Mexico Military Institute faculty, and he is here as a service provider because he cares about you, and he knows that he has something to share with you that could impact your life. So give a big hand for, for Dr. Bruder for being here tonight. Good evening. Tonight, I want to talk with you about the familiar and the strange. What's a word that sounds kind of like familiar? Fam family. When we started out in life, growing in our mother's womb. Every day was the same. We didn't actually recognize such a thing as separate days. As a matter of fact, we weren't capable of making any distinction at all. Because our experience was undifferentiated, warm, fluid embrace. Life in that liquid environment, warm and safe and well-fed. We passed the time without recognizing any distinctions at all. When we were born, we all experienced a terrific shock because it was radically different from what we'd been experiencing since any possibility of awareness had emerged. And that shock of difference introduced variety of experience into our lives. Once born, especially in a safe, loving, caregiving environment, we were treated to service 24-7. Mother, father, other caregivers took care of our every need. And when we bawled and squalled, it meant we wanted changing, we wanted food, we wanted a cuddle, we wanted, we wanted. We felt a sense of lack or absence, and we strove to fulfill the need in the only way we knew how. We cried out. I'm pretty convinced that if that cry wasn't as annoying, as attention arresting, as disturbing as it is, we'd all die in early life because no one would be motivated sufficiently to take care of those needs. First to explore what we need, and then to give it to us. Now in that family, we kept having the round of routine, everyday experience. We're fed, we're burped, we lie down, we nap, we awake, we're uncomfortable, we cry, our needs are met, and around and around and around we go. The same, the same, the same. This routine 
was the texture of most of our early experience. It's only if we had the misfortune of neglectful caregivers that this wasn't likely our experience all the time, and even then, probably at least a good deal of the time. Whatever it was, it kept coming much the same way from much the same players for a great deal of time. Now, of course, this is all experience that predates your memory of experience. But you probably had little brothers or sisters or nephews or nieces or somebody that you've seen go through this caretaking routine. In that routine, we were safe and we felt safe. Our needs were cared for, and if there was something that represented difference or a shock to our system, it was usually dealt with, and we were restored to the, the round of everyday routine, safe, warm, familiar experience. In the family, we cultivated a sense of what was familiar. And whenever there was something that happened that was news of difference, by the way, that's a definition of information, news of difference. As this information came into our awareness, our typical way of handling it is, everything is the same as everything else except when it isn't. Everything is the same as everything else except when it isn't. And then we're going to figure it out. We're sense-making beings, and we've sought meaning. We try to figure stuff out. It's the way we're endowed as human beings, to cope with life's challenges, upsets, or just to make your way in an otherwise untroubled world. But that round, that routine, that habitual way of experiencing life, in the company of familiar others, doing things much the same as we did them the day before, that was family for us. The foundation of our experience as a human being. This familiar zone of comfort and safety and rightness and goodness and well-being. Comes the day that we encounter someone different than we're used to. What have you observed young children, even toddlers, do when, for example, they're put into the arms of someone they don't know. Cry. Again, ball and squall. We call it separation anxiety because I'm taken out of my familiar, safe, secure life world and something has intruded or invaded and upset that, that balance, that comfort, that safety, that familiar. Enough time goes by, we learn to integrate, to make sense of, to figure out the stuff that comes to us. Again, it's either just like what I've already experienced or it's marginally different and so I have to do a little bit of figuring, but pretty rapidly I become used to it if it's again part of my new familiar round. What happens? is that eventually experience appears, either it comes to us or we go to it, and that experience is something for which we don't have a familiar, ready explanation. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to act. I don't know what to do next. I have to cope. I have to keep safe. I'll go back to the familiar if I can, and if I can't, if the familiar is unavailable, what do you suppose I think of it? Yeah, I, my reaction is going to be, it's very strange, I don't like this. Because it's different than I'm used to and I haven't had to cope with this before, it's very likely going to be something that I react to as representing danger, as wrong, as alien, as strange. The strange is just anything that's sufficiently different from what I'm used to that I can't figure it out. I don't have a ready explanation, and I feel, at minimal, discomfort. Maybe 
I feel real panic. Maybe it represents enough danger, enough cause of upset, that I move to defend myself. You know, you have an automatic response mechanism, a kind of total system, what should we call it? Amplification of readiness to deal with upset, with difficulty, with danger. We call it the fight or flight mechanism. And what it does is it releases cortisol and uh, adrenaline and other neurotransmitters and hormones that get you ready to run, run away or fight for your life. And in the presence of the sufficiently unfamiliar, you just do that. It's not something you're choosing to do. It's not something that you're making happen. It's just the automatic response to felt threat, jeopardy, risk, danger. Strange. Stranger. Stranger danger. You get it? The strange. Thanks. The stranger is the embodiment of the strange. The stranger represents a threat, a violation, a wrongness, a basic object of rejection, aversion, and withdrawal. I must protect myself. Do you follow? So, I'm trying to suggest to you that human beings grow up, typically, in caregiving environments that support them in a safe haven of happiness and well-being because it's couched in or immersed in routine, safety, sameness, family. The familiar. So a couple of things to notice. Whatever it is that you grew up with, in terms of the foods you eat, the clothes you wear, the music you like, the basic entertainments that you enjoy, the aspirations and hopes that you have, your notions of right and wrong, the whole package is deeply cultured. It is, it is something that instructs or informs you how to live. This is the way a human being lives. That's how we think. And so, when we're in that, everything's like, Okay, it's cool. I can handle it. It's safe. I'm okay. My world's okay. But as soon as I get something in my life experience, in my field of view, in my hearing, in my presence altogether, I automatically go into a mode that rejects, that defends against, that withdraws from, that puts up shields against the different, the strange. Because I don't know how to cope with it. I don't understand it. It makes me feel weird. It's not right. I need to fly back to the familiar world with all haste to preserve my safety and my happiness. I'm trying to suggest that we're all set up we're all programmed to just reaffirm what we already know, to re-experience what we've already felt, to recreate a world, wherever we are, that supports us in happiness and well-being and safety. Trouble is, <laughs> the world is not simply made up of people like me or you. The world is made up of a variety of human beings, each with their own familiar, each with their own coping strategies for life's challenges. Indeed, what they regard as a challenge and what they look at as a happy event is likely different from what mine is. And everybody in, in here has some unique or idiosyncratic features of your life experience, your familiar life world, that I don't share. 
and that everybody else in here doesn't share. Now, because we tend to live in communities that are more or less homogenous, that is, our immediate family and the people with whom we hang, tend to be people who are more or less like ourselves, we're supported in the illusion that this is the world. This is the way things are. And we go with unruffled feathers from moment to moment, for the most part confirmed in our feeling of happiness and safety. Or if not happiness, at least we're getting along. We're OK. So again, we are all programmed for a particular manner of experience, for a particular way of life. That's our culture. And of course, it includes the way we speak and what language we speak, and the costume and the, the cuisine and the art and the notions of right and wrong, the whole package again. What happens, however, if the world outside, the different, the strange, comes into my world and presents itself? What happens if a family move or my work or going to school somewhere puts me in contact with the sufficiently different to cause upset? Something, someone that is strange enough that it provokes in me this automatic reaction of, I must protect myself, defense, shields up. How do we deal? Either we flee and go back to the familiar if that's available to us, or we have to define the situation we're in. And often, because it's strange, the definition ain't pretty. Because the stranger is dangerous. Because the, the different, the... Uh, The different provokes in us a response, an automatic knee-jerk response, pure reactivity. And that reactivity often takes a shape that is consistent with a manner of self-defense. That is, my shields go up and I define the other as maximally other, as different in the extreme, as strange to the point of my discomfort because they're dangerous. This explains a great deal about why it is that we'll feel comfortable in the familiar environs that we travel, whereas we have difficulty even making contact with, much less satisfying interaction with, or developing a relationship with someone who is other, someone who is different, someone who is strange. I'm trying to tell you it's no surprise that we react the way, way that we typically do when we encounter someone sufficiently different from ourselves. Of course we hate them. They're dangerous. Of course they're wrong. I'm right. Of course what they're up to, their notions about what's important in life and how we should live, they're crazy. They're weird. Of course, obviously, because this is what a normal human being is. And everybody and everything else is weird and wrong to the degree that it differs from me. You get this? We're all the center of our own little universes. We're all observing a world that seems to be in orbit around ourselves. And our judgment of that world has everything to do with what's familiar and the degree to which whatever it is that is an object of my awareness that I'm thinking or feeling about is the same as me or different from me. My judgment will be automatic and usually my action decisive. I want to restore the feeling of happiness and well-being that I have in my familiar world. So if you don't map onto that, if you don't look like that, if you don't sound like that, you don't smell like that, you don't listen to music like that, you don't like the things that I like, etc., then do you even have a right to be? 
Do you? Well, from my perspective, you're in violation of the code of conduct and the rules for living and the notions of what's best that I grew up with. So, of course, I'm at war with you. Of course, I don't accept you. Of course, I'm intolerant of and judgmental of you. Do you get this? We're all doing this all the time. It's automatic. We're not trying to make it so that we can't relate to people who are different. They just occur for us as wrong and dangerous. I didn't want to come to that conclusion. Life served it up to me. Life set me up, programmed me to respond in this way because that's the way that I stay safe in the face of danger. Is this making sense? Okay. So let me refer you to this slide behind me. Cultural and evaluation antipodes. Antipodes is a fancy word, maybe a bit old-timey. It means pairs of extreme different things. Very, very different ideas. In this case, adjectives. Words that we use to describe stuff. So look at the first two. We've already covered some of that. Familiar on the one hand, strange on the other. Now look at the lists beneath of more adjectives. Beneath familiar, we have good, right, known, normal, sane, sacred, pure, safe, beautiful, delicious, invisible, healthy, easy, self, subject. Now I'm not going to cover all this. I'm just going to introduce you to the lists and we'll touch on some important points along the way. Look at this other list. Would you, what would, how would you characterize, generally speaking, the familiar? All nice stuff, yeah? There's a couple that you might have questions about. That's okay. How about this other list? Evil, wrong, unknown, abnormal, insane, profane, polluted, dangerous, ugly, nasty, visible, etc. This is not a happy list. This is not good stuff to be. But can you see that these pairs of opposites, listen up, these pairs of opposites are the interpretive matrix that our mind automatically applies to whatever we experience. To the degree that someone or something is familiar, they're good, right, known, normal, sane, etc. To the degree that something represents difference or the strange, I'm going to see it as evil, wrong, abnormal, etc. All this ugly stuff that just comes up, again, as a judgment, unbidden, automatically, and it's just there for us to see. We don't even see the people or the things. We just see these labels. Because it, what to get about this is it's, it's actually a useful strategy. It keeps us safe. It actually works much of the time. By keeping with our own, by not venturing too far away from the familiar, we do keep safe most of the time except in extremely unusual circumstances, staying with what's familiar is a recipe for continued life and happiness and well-being. It keeps us safe, but it also separates us. It cuts us off. It makes it difficult, sometimes impossible, to have any contact with the different, the strange, the other. And such contact as we do have, typically, is conditioned by the fact that we're on our guard, that our defenses are up, that we're looking for trouble, and we usually find it. Surprise! Of course you're going to find it. They're as programmed for their way of life as you are for yours. So they're just going to keep on being them. They're going to keep on with their otherness, despite the fact that you're showing them how they should be. How generous of you. Isn't that what we do? 
We judge from in, inside here. We make our assessment of the other, and we've got them figured out. At least we have them figured out enough to stay alive and happy and safe into the next moment. I guess this is a good time to suggest to you as the stereotyping that I'm describing, the way that we apply these already established understandings, these labels that help us figure the world out, to make sense out of reality, that readiness to apply this way of figuring things out, it sets us up for failure in our encounters with difference. It sets us up for conflict, for disagreement, and for hurt, being hurt and hurting the other, because we don't know how to be with them. And oddly enough, because, for example, my way is not their way, when I do things my way, I'm satisfied that things are going well. They do things their way, I'm reacting to it. And each of us <laughs> has this tendency to extend to the other the very courtesy that we would want for ourselves. If we're willing to have an encounter, if we're willing to, say, have a conversation, then every one of us, in good faith, is doing for the other what we would want done to us, that old golden rule thing, right? Trouble is, maybe they don't want what we're offering because it's not what they would want in these circumstances. It's what you want for you. It's not what they want for them. And so even when we're trying, even when we're making room for the other and attempting to make contact, we blunder. We do things and say things and show up ways that the other reacts to as wrong, as perhaps even evil. And we meant it for good. We tried to do what we thought was best. Trouble is, we have different standards for what's best. And so again, we blunder. We make mistakes. We violate their customs, their expectations, their rules for life, just like they're violating ours. Do you see? We're set up for failure in our efforts to have satisfying, productive, happy contact with people unlike ourselves. And it's just going to keep being that way. I, I'm not here to tell you that you can just stop this, or even that you should. You're just carrying out your programming that's kept you alive until now, served you for the most part, supported you in a life that you can cope with, right? These automatic knee-jerk responses, these reflexes that appear, that emerge in response to difference. They have worked for us. But I'm trying to say to you, just notice. Just watch yourself doing it. Observe your reactions. Witness the fact that you tend to judge people in terms that you regard as right and true and good. And they're doing the same thing from their perspective. In order for us to have any possibility of connecting with people unlike ourselves, we have to first acknowledge that they're just pro as programmed as we are. And conversely, we're just as programmed to be who we are as they. Let me tell you a story. There was a friend of mine named Henju Kim. He was from Seoul, South Korea. And he'd come to Michigan State roughly the same time as for his doctorate when I was starting my master's program at Michigan State University. This was a few years back, 1985 to be precise. And Henju, when he would walk with his male friends back home in Seoul, walking down the street, they'd hold hands. Because they're buddies, they're pals, they're connected. They care for each other. They're looking out for each other. They got each other's backs. Same feelings you have, just expressed by walking hand in hand. 
Now, we wouldn't think much of that maybe between two young ladies, but we would probably remark upon it as a member of this society if we saw two males doing it, yes? Well, that's what Henju Kim experienced, was he was getting stares from the people around East Lansing, Michigan, when he was walking with his fellow Korean friends hand in hand. And it was only because somebody cared enough to bring it up to him that he learned that that meant something very different in East Lansing, Michigan in 1985 than it did back home in Seoul. You get me? It suggested that they were romantic partners. And that wasn't what he was meaning to show at all. Now, he lived in East Lansing for a couple of years before he got to go back to Seoul. Guess what happened when he got back to Seoul and was walking downtown and saw two young men holding hands? Yes, he reacted to it very much like the people in East Lansing had a couple years before reacted to him. Look what happened. His familiar became strange. And his strange had become familiar. Sometimes life serves us up sufficient experience so that the values, the, the signs, you could say, go from positive to negative, like in math, or from negative to positive. Once we get used to a thing, once it becomes a routine, even if it's a, quote, new routine, unquote, we eventually settle in, we get accustomed to it, it becomes our familiar. And in as much as it works for us and sustains us in a life that is reasonably satisfying, we accept that new familiar. And our, it's like our default settings get recalibrated, and now we're used to something that used to be strange, now familiar. And so, and so, and so, it goes on and on and on. Initial resistance, judgment, evaluation, eventual getting used to it, pretty much comfortable with it. Finally, it's, okay, I'm okay with this. And it passes out of awareness. It becomes taken for granted. You see this pair here, invisible, visible? The familiar is invisible. The fact that you have a culture is unknown to you. You typically only see what it is that you would regard as your cultural programming because it contrasts with something, somebody else's. You begin to notice it only because of the reflection of the other person showing you this is relative. In other words, I see their way. They're not doing it to piss me off. They're not doing it to be weird. They're not doing it to be revolutionary. They're doing it because that's their authentic way of being. That's what, how they were trained, just like mine. And so I see that their familiar really is theirs. It's my strange. My familiar is strange to them. And once we relativize this, something becomes possible for us that wasn't before. I can actually imagine myself in the place of the other. I can acknowledge that they're a person just like I am, that they were trained to be the sort of person that they are, just like I've been trained to be the sort of person I am. To live life, to hold values, to embrace beliefs, to eat foods, to dance my dance and sing my song. It's it's all relative. I know how to do my way of life. I don't know how to do theirs. But if I spend time with them, understanding that they just like, just like me, they have standards and expectations. They have notions of right and wrong. And while they differ from mine, they are just as automatically and uniformly embraced and enacted by them as mine is by me. <clears throat> when I can recognize that, when I can hold in my awareness 
the fact that the person that I encounter who's different from me is just carrying out their programming like I'm carrying out mine. That we're all dealing with a, a, a scary reality that sometimes shows up dangerous and inscrutable. That is, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand. I don't get it. They're coping just like I am. <clears throat> now, we live in an interesting age because everybody's everywhere. Either somebody comes from somewhere else and comes where you are, or you go where somebody else lives and you're with them, or you plug in online and through the wonder of the internet you have the whole world available to you, sights and sounds, knowledge and experience. It's all there. We're truly available to each other as human beings in a way that we simply never have been before. And so my exposure to difference has become much, much greater than it once was. And so the urgent need for me to be able to deal effectively with that, for me to be able to cope with encounters with difference, has become urgent in the extreme. Because your life is going to be lived in the company of different others, more than your grandparents or your great-grandparents, to be sure. In my grandparents' time, it was common for people to live the whole of their lives never venturing more than 25 miles from home. Never. Me, I've lived all over the world. That wasn't possible. It wasn't desirable. In fact, it was something that would be regarded as weird, eccentric at best for someone to have done in my grandparents' time. But life is forcing you into encounters with the strange in a way that it wasn't for bygone eras. We actually enjoy this incredible advantage and opportunity over our forebears because every way of life that is authentically human is some group's way of coping with life's challenges in a way that's creative, that's interesting, and that works for them. I'm not saying everything is for everybody. What I'm saying is there's a whole lot more ways of coping with or dealing with reality than we ever imagined. And the only way we're going to be able to access it is if we come into contact with difference, whether it's mediated, like online, or it's in direct encounters. They come to me, I go to them, whatever. I'm in contact with difference. And that encounter with difference can make all the difference if we respond to it appropriately. That is, we have an opportunity to learn from each other. But first, we have to mindfully encounter the other in a way that doesn't result in killing them or being killed by them. And then, doing better still, being in their company in a way that we tolerate each other. And then, going further, getting used to each other. Further still, oh, that's interesting. That's different. But not in the reactive, I'm in danger sense, but wow, I never thought of doing it that way. Imagine that. This is a possibility, a way of figuring things out, a way of coping, whatever, whatever it might be. I have to first recognize that life has prepared me to be me and not to be anybody else. Just like you have been prepared to be you and like nobody else, you are unique. But the sameness, samenesses that are in evidence, that exist in our close company, our families, our close social groups, our companies when we're, in, say, employed some years hence, those provide for us safe havens of sameness, for the most part. Although they are becoming increasingly diverse. And with that diversity comes both challenge and opportunity. 
we have the chance to encounter difference and not just to automatically react with shields, with offense, with judgment, with hate. That might have been the way that we were disposed to react, but because we notice that we're doing it, and they're doing it, and all human beings <clears throat> have been precisely set up precisely to do this, a possibility emerges that didn't before. I can endure it. I can hang with it. I can even, possibly, <clears throat> and wouldn't it be a wonder if I could appreciate it, <clears throat> if I could re respond to it with support, <clears throat> with a measure of care, with regard, with respect, with esteem, because I can appreciate that this person represents a way of life which, though not my own, is rich and varied and interesting and worth understanding. But I've got to break through that barrier of automatic defense and judgment and name-calling and offense and all of it. Until, in other words, I have the capacity to see past the limits of what I'm used to and at least begin to open up to and eventually perhaps even to embrace the holy other, understanding that they're just like me in being different. They're just like me in, in carrying out their, their programming for living a life that is safe and happy. I would like you to consider the fact that when you get weirded out by people who show up differently than you, you're not choosing to make that happen. It's just part of that self-protective system that has been erected in your mind and altogether in your social circles. And it's worked pretty well for you. But we're living a life now that is much, much more exposed to difference. I have to be awake, aware, and caring enough to choose to be in an encounter with what's different from me so that I can get familiar with the strange. And so that the strange, having become a little bit more familiar, I'll be able to cope with it in ways that don't result in the negativity and the hostility and the withdrawal that would have been my automatic response if I wasn't awake to this, if I didn't understand. So I'm going to round this up. I suppose that I'm hoping that this is something you understand and that you are open to it. All you have to do, in my judgment, is look around your life and you'll see that this is self-evident. My judgment of somebody, it ain't personal. It's because they're sufficiently different to provoke a reaction, that's all. I may even be fooled into thinking I hate them. I don't. It's just that our programming is incompatible. So we have to arise to a higher level of observation and see that we're both doing the same thing. And we can make a life together, and we can learn from each other, and we can share life together. We're living in a privileged moment, folks. We have the opportunity to put together pieces that have been widely separated for a very long time. We have, we, we have the opportunity to transcend the limited 
provincial, very isolated thinking of our forebearers. and actually encounter difference with enthusiasm and maybe even love. This is what it's going to take to live into our destiny as human beings. We can't get where we need to go and where we could go unless unless we make this shift in our awareness. So, take it on. Thank you for your courteous attention. Please, please stay seated, stay seated. Oh, the people that need to get to study hall, you are dismissed. The people that need to get to study hall, you're dismissed. Facilitators, I need you down.